Uh, Representative Long um, has House File 1267. Representative Long moves to refer House File 1267 to the Ways and Means Committee. Uh, Representative Long, your bill Thank is you, before Ms. us. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That is my motion. Everyone incarcerate, every incarcerated person deserves to receive appropriate health care and safe conditions. But unfortunately, we know that is not the case in Minnesota today. Thanks to the investigative reporting of CARE Levin's Cruel and Unusual series and others, we've heard the heartbreaking stories of the conditions in some of our jails. Tragically, some have died while in state custody, over 50 since 2015. You will hear two of those stories today. Uh, Brett Huber Sr., the father of Brett Huber Jr., and Del Shea Perry, the mother of Hardell Shirell. Nationally, suicides account for 31% of jail deaths, but in Minnesota, we have double the national average suicides account for 60% of deaths in our jails. The Department of Corrections has the authority to license correctional facilities and to set minimum standards, but this authority has not been updated in 50 years. It is confusing, vague, and has little teeth. The use of force statute covering our correctional facilities has not changed since 1905. This bill that we're hearing today would do three main things. It would update the minimum standards for licensed facilities to reflect current best practices. It would increase transparency for detention facilities in Minnesota, and it would ensure accountability for violations of minimum standards by licensed facilities. We've also heard public concern about the use of jails to board Department of Correction inmates for space constraints. And while this bill may not go as far as some would prefer, it does create transparency in these practices requiring reporting, including reporting of demographic data. I commend Commissioner Shell for owning the department's role, listening to those impacted and working with the Sheriff's Association and community organizations on this piece of legislation. I stand willing to engage with community members in this committee to make sure we get this difficult problem right. And I do have an author's amendment, Mr. Chair, if, if you'd like to take that now. Very well, uh, Representative Long, um, uh, up to you. Uh, we, uh, if you wanna move your author's amendment, we can do that right now, absolutely. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. We, uh, the author's amendment would just make some technical changes and it would improve uh, also the language on chokeholds in the bill with the, uh, improved definition, would provide some more flexibility on uh, limited license suspension, would clarify the notification timeline for uh, deaths in jails, and would make clear that licenses will be suspended in circumstances where there's an imminent risk of harm or life-threatening injury. So it's to get the bill in the shape the author would like. Well, Representative Law, why don't we hold off on your author's amendment and hear testimony first? Okay. Uh, and then we can come back to that, if that's okay with you. Mr. Thank you. Chair. Well, Representative Rowling. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, if I could ask the chair to let us know which amendment, when it's time to introduce the amendments, because we've got several amendments before us, and I want to keep track of them as we're looking at each of the amendments, Mr. Chair. You bet. Will do. Um, uh, with that, why don't we move to the uh, testifier um, portion of the, of, of the bill presentation. Um, Representative Long. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. We'll, we'll first hear from the Department of Corrections. Um, is uh, Amy Lorisella. Very well, welcome to the committee and please state your name for the record and give us your testimony. Thank you, Chair and members. Uh, good morning. Um, my name is Amy Lorisella. I'm the specialist in the Government and External Relations Unit for the Department of Corrections. I facilitated the drafting of this bill with our experts and stakeholders. I'm a civil and human rights attorney with over 10 years of policy development, systems audits, and investigative experience, both uh, domestically and internationally. And I've worked with incarcerated persons um, as well as people who've experienced violence. And I'm grateful to be here with you today. Um, to run through the bill just quickly, I'm gonna try to share my screen um, so that we can kind of follow along together. Let me just get that pulled up for you. Can you all see this? Yes. Great, okay, excellent. So uh, what we're doing here is uh, amending Minnesota Statute 241.021, which is a statute uh, on our correctional licensing authority. And uh, the first section addresses a couple of things. The first thing that it does is really just ensure that there are very specific categories um, where the department is gonna be providing guidance to licensed facilities 
on uh, what those minimum standards should be. Um, it's including things like mental health, medication administration, um, when information needs to be shared with medical personnel about the folks who are incarcerated in these facilities and when they need to facilitate medical assessment, including things uh, such as policy training, things like death review, um, of, uh, updating the minimum standards on, on things that as of now, you know, have become sort of common practice um, and are considered best practices nationally. Next, what it does is it clarifies the licensing expiration date. Uh, it's a two-year license. We don't change that, but it just confirms that once that two-year period ends, if that license has not been renewed, um, it is expired. And then scrolling down, I know I'm going a little quickly, but hopefully folks have had a chance to review the bill as well. Um, the other thing that it does is it clarifies that uh, it shortens the time frame for reporting when in custody deaths happen. Right now it's a 10 year time, uh, a 10 day time period and rule, and it's gonna update that to be a 24 hour time period. And then scrolling down here are the strikeout language that you're gonna see. This is just the rest of the, of the current statute where no changes were made. So we're moving this, this section of strikeout language is just being reorganized again, because the statute is so old. Um, it was all kind of contained in one sec, one subdivision. And so we've broken it out to make it a little more uh, we, uh, understandable and um, wieldy. So subdivision section two of the bill creates a new subdivision, subdivision 1A. And what this does is it creates, and it sort of codifies what's already occurring in our rule and, and what we've been doing in practice by issuing correction orders and conditional licensure orders. So what this section of the bill does is it just updates that very old language and it clarifies the way that the commissioner may, may act, not when revoking a license, but how they can support changes to ensure that minimum standards are being met. It's sort of the, uh, what we view as a, the technical assistance portion of um, our, our licensing authority. And then it also authorizes the commissioner to lift those conditional licensure orders or correction orders um, once satisfactory progress is being made towards that minimum standards and compliance with those. Section three, pardon me while I scroll again. Section three, this is the relocated area that I talked about above. This has to do with our revocation authority that already is in statute. Um, so it, it relocates it. And really what it does is it, it defines a very clear process for revocation, which is not currently in law. And it um, affords facilities an opportunity to engage, provide a response and, and participate. Scrolling on. Okay, subdivision 1C here, this is section four. This is new statutory authority that we were proposing. Um, and it, it allows the Department of Corrections to temporarily and immediately suspend a license only if there is an imminent risk of life-threatening harm or serious physical injury to either the persons confined or incarcerated in the facility or staff, law enforcement who oftentimes have to go in, visitors or the public. And then here, section five is establishing a process for licensed facilities to request reconsideration and appeal those department licensing actions that are envisioned in the statute. And then section six, this is a section of the statute where we establish some annual reporting requirements for the Department of Corrections to the legislature. It's gonna include things like uh, information on the number of individuals who have died in custody in licensed and state correctional facilities, information on death review results, should there have been policy changes that were implemented afterwards, um, information on uses of force inside correctional facilities, information on individuals committed to the custody of the Department of Corrections, but who are housed outside of DOC facilities. And then the last one here is uh, only, only applies to the Department of Corrections, but summary data on complaints. Uh, and discipline for uh, staff that have been filed. Section seven, this is just relocating the definition. We have not changed the definition of correctional facility. We left that alone. We just had to reorganize it. Section eight right here, 
This is a, an area where we're requiring all correctional facilities to provide a release of information form right away at intake for uh, the release of information on somebody's health condition in the event that they become incapacitated. It does not require the individual to uh, sign it, but it just is, is an opportunity for them to designate somebody should they want to. And then section nine here is establishing death review teams and requiring correctional facilities to create a process. Uh, it does articulate that there are certain, certain individuals that should be involved, a mental health expert uh, to the extent that it's uh, appropriate, definitely will need a medical, uh, an expert who can provide the information on medical services. Um, and what this does is it doesn't actually require that the review itself be shared with the Department of Corrections, but, but it requires that any changes um, made to policy or practice following the review be shared with the department. And then last here, we have section 10. This is an area of statute that has uh, was originated at least as old as over 100 years ago, and it has not been substantially updated since then. Um, there have been some limited changes, but overall, you know, this, this is our, our statute that authorizes use of force. And what it does is what we're looking to do is amend that um, correctional officer discipline use of force statute to prohibit certain things that are no longer best practice in terms of restraints, including the chokeholds, and then defining what deadly force is and when it's justified. Um, and then the last section of it just creates a duty to report when staff observe either neglect or an excessive use of force in a facility. That concludes the summary of House File 1267, and I'm happy to stick around for questions when it's time. Very well, thank you, Ms. Laricella, for, for walkthrough uh, of the bill. Representative Long. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Next, we'll hear from Commissioner Schnell. Commissioner Schnell, welcome to the committee. Good morning, Mr. Chair, committee members. Uh, again, it's a pleasure to be with you. I'm gonna make my comments very brief because I think the folks that you hear after me are gonna be um, important to, to hear from. Um, members, this is a high priority matter, um, and I think uh, you will hear why uh, in, a, in the upcoming testimony. Uh, if you've had a chance to see any of the CARE 11 expose, I think it, it elevates uh, um, this. I think certainly uh, the governor has had an opportunity to meet with uh, many of these family members um, and uh, for him uh, was uh, compelling. Um, I wanna thank uh, the family members who are gonna be here, who are with us today uh, and, and watching this very closely. A couple of them you're going to hear from um, uh, immediately after me. Uh, we've heard uh, from family members, uh, uh, members that, that uh, this bill does not go far enough. And I understand that as well. Um, I recognize that, uh, that, that there is more work to be done, that this is and, and should be, is and should be an area of importance, but we believe this is a much needed step in the right direction. Um, and, and I will assure you that this will not be the end of this conversation going forward. Uh, but an important first step. I want to uh, also say thank you to the Sheriff's Association who uh, provided four sheriffs from across the state and agencies uh, big and large and small uh, who really represented their members in helping us uh, craft and develop the language before you today. Um, we have heard from uh, the Executive Director, Mr. Hutton, that the Sheriff's Association has uh, is generally supportive of the language here. Um, uh, and of course, um, the committee has a number of, of amendments before it today. Um, and we understand that this bill may look different as it goes through this process. Uh, and we are committed to engaging with any of the members uh, and, and anyone who really has uh, concerns that we um, can address as we go forward. I just want to say that as the agency responsible for the regulatory uh, role provided to us uh, and, it's, and uh, required of us by the legislature that um, I uh, take this as a, a, a personal area of a deep concern. Um, many of these concerns have been long standing um, and it is, it is a due time um, and, uh, and shouldn't have been based upon tragedy, but, but that is where we find ourselves that we uh, address this. Um, and I, I will tell you that I am uh, wholly committed to that. Um, I will also say that, that as we look at the broader, uh, and I know we will be talking about the, the budget elements of this in the future, but there is an, uh, in the OLA uh, audit, as you will recall, um, hearing some weeks ago now, that there was uh, some recommendations around the use of 
uh, and having inspections occur. And we believe that having inspections occur um, is one of the ways that we do this, making sure that there's consistency and practice across our correctional facilities in the state. And we intend to have um, some additional inspections resources to be able to, uh, to do in these uh, important and critical standards expect, uh, uh, inspections in our facilities as well. I also want to point out that if you watch the series that there was uh, concerns raised about medical provision and, and uh, contract services that are available, we share that concern. Uh, we know that there is lots of attention around this uh, across our state. And we've uh, been watching this very closely because uh, ultimately that is outside of the DOC's uh, scope of authority. Uh, and that really falls under um, the contract medical providers, a, a licensed medical or physician who does that, which uh, then falls under the Board of Medical Practice. So there is some, some differences in how some of this stuff comes together, um, but we look to see ways to, to better coordinate. I can't stress enough members uh, that this is a crisis situation. I think uh, the folks you hear from immediately uh, after me um, will, will make that clear. Um, and with that, Mr. Chair, I would like to uh, turn this over to Mr. Huber, who will testify uh, as a person who's been impacted um, uh, and, and lost a son. Uh, and, um, and then after that, we'll be happy to answer questions. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Commissioner. Uh, Mr. Huber, uh, welcome uh, to our committee. Uh, thank you for being um, with us here uh, today. Uh, please um, state your name uh, for, for the record uh, and give us your testimony, please, sir. Thank you, Chairman Mariani and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Brett Warner Huber Sr. I'm the father of Brett Warner Huber Jr., my deceased son. Um, I'm also a son, a father, a husband, a granddad, and a heartlander. I have roots to Minnesota where my folks live in Murray County on Lake Sarah. I've just purchased land in the, in the area and plan to retire here in Minnesota. I do that because this is a state of good people. This is a state of neighbors that care about neighbors. It's a state of people that are quick to wave, quick with a smile, um, quick to help when needed, and, and quick to stay out of your business when not needed. So I appreciate um, this area. I appreciate the people of this area, and I appreciate all of your service. So a little bit about my background. I've been in politics in Alaska for off and on for nearly 30 years. I served both as chief of staff in the Alaska State Senate to a number of individuals and the administrative branch <clears throat> where my last post was director of policy and communications for the governor. This isn't about me today, it's about Brett. Brett Jr. was a beautiful young man. Uh, he was a loving family member. He was a Christian both in belief and in practice and in action. That young man had a super intellect and it was amazing physical specimen. He was a caring kid that lived his life by the motto he loved, which was be quick to love and slow to judge. I'm here for Brett today and for the rest of my family, not because any of us can affect his horrific outcome, but because he would want to help ensure that no other human beings or their families find themselves in this same situation. I have to tell you that Many people, and understandably, um, retreat from a situation like this and grieve. I found myself in that same situation after this first occurred, but then understood that it's important for people not to just retreat and grieve, but also dig into the facts and share the stories and raise public awareness. And I appreciate the opportunity to help do that today. Uh, Brett was an achiever. He was a varsity wrestler while he was still in junior high. He was a master scuba diver at age 11. Um, he was an emergency first responder and a lifeguard as he was a teen. He was a bright and witty kid, but my son was also an addict and his drug of choice is MDMA. For it was not just an addict, he was dual diagnosed. Um, his addiction as well as serious anxiety and depression issues. Those came and went and Brett went through that horrible cycle of treatment, recovery and relapse. That's difficult for families Difficult for all involved, but the most difficult for the individual that finds themselves in that circumstance. Brett's professional career included the Alaska legislature where he began as a Senate page. He went on to staff for the co-chairs of the House Finance Committee for two sessions. Um, he then decided that he wanted to try a little bit bigger pond and was hired and went to work for Senate, US Senator Dan Sullivan in Washington, DC. I don't tell you that to exalt Brett, 
I tell you that to emphasize that no one is immune from this situation. No one is immune from the scourge of what drugs and mental illness can do to an individual and to a family. No one. All right. I appreciate you letting me refer to my notes today. Absolutely. The problems that to address are absolutely in a crisis situation. I couldn't agree more. Um, we all know family members, friends, neighbors who suffer or have suffered from an addiction or a mental illness. Um, it is not the, it's commonplace, right? That's the society that we live in. That's the difficult times that we live in. So on March 18th, 2017, my son suffered a psychotic break just days before he was working in the United States Senate. He left his position, was on my way to my parents' house in Southwest Minnesota, when he hooked up with a girl that he knew in the cities and apparently went on one last binge. He was taken by her to the hospital in Alexandria. His psychotic break led him to believe that he was trying to be killed, that his life was in danger. He fled, stole two vehicles, and was apprehended on top of a semi-trailer on I-94. Um, if you haven't seen the footage, you're, you're, it is difficult, disturbing, horrific in nature, but speaks clearly to anybody that has watched it, including over the one million views on the internet, that this young man was not in his right mind. After being apprehended, he was taken to Sauk Center Hospital, where his irrational fears and behavior continued to be prison. Um, during that time and before any help was being able to be provided, the Todd County officers arrested Brett and took him to Todd County Jail, where he remained without psychiatric evaluation or any mental health treatment until he hanged himself on his cell on June 9th of that year. Let me emphasize that again. Without a psychiatric evaluation, although it was court ordered, without any mental health treatment from March to June, there were multiple off-roads available to save my son's life. At the time, I didn't know that. At the time, I had no idea exactly what was happening within that facility. That's one of the issues that I hope is addressed and could be addressed further by this bill with the ability to let a family member understand what's going on and be an advocate, especially when somebody's having mental health situations. Um, I talked to the jail repeatedly. I took a leave of absence from my position, came down to my folks' house, presented myself every opportunity I had to visit my son, which was 20 minutes, two days a week, through the glass and tried my best to keep his spirits up, to level him off, to let him know that help was on the way, to let him know that he was in a safe place and that the people there were caring for him. Uh, I, could, I find after the fact that it could not have been more wrong. There were multiple incidents, hallucinations, visual hallucinations, auditory hallucinations, suicidal ideations, suicidal attempts, Yet all of those things took place and still no mental health evaluation and no mental health treatment. At the same time, I was being told by jail administrators that your son's doing fine. We've got him. We're taking good care of the boy. Your son's doing fine. Could not have been further from the truth. So I was after Brett's incident. That's how it was described to me when they called me. Your son has had an incident. What's wrong? Is he okay? That's all we can tell you. So after discovering what that incident was, and that my son was, was lying on the floor of his jail cell for 10 minutes, deprived of oxygen, while well checks were being falsified and nobody was monitoring the camera, um, I, I immediately asked for all of the information and all of the evidence. And I received nothing from Todd County. Not a callback, not a bit of information, nothing. So as often is the case, the only way to get to the bottom of something is to litigate. We're not a litigious family. It's the last thing that we wanted to do, but it is one thing that we had to do to learn the truth. So I turn your attention to case number 018-CV-0237-SRN-LIB, which was filed in the US District Court on August 8th of 2018. Today's not about retrying the case. I'd just like you all to take a look at that if you have an opportunity because it is a horrific example of how the current laws and policies are failing. Not just the victims, but the general public. I applaud you all for stepping up and serving the public in the capacities that you've chosen. Um, it is not a small responsibility. I understand that. It oftentimes comes with long hours um, and, and little reward. I understand that as well. 
I have a deep respect for law enforcement. I have law enforcement in my family. Um, part of my part of my purview within the governor's office was the Department of Corrections, Department of Public Safety, and Department of Law for the state of Alaska. I understand that there are delicate balances and that there are difficulties in dealing with these situations. But Minnesota and your county jails are just so far behind the curve that it's truly, to me, uh, it's just abominable. And I appreciate Representative Long for bringing this bill forward and for y'all for hearing the bill today. So this pattern of misconduct, I had no idea. Um, a, a young man died in the facility a month before my son did. Had no idea. Two jail inspections were performed in the years before my son's death, where well checks were being falsified or not being conducted, where all of the problems that were identified that led to Brett's demise were identified previously, yet nothing was done about it. This is a small first step. I agree with the commissioner. I think there's a lot of things that the commissioner can do administratively to help in this situation as well. And I look forward to seeing that happen. I hear the words, but I'm a trust and verify guy. So I'll be glad to be involved in this process as we continue through the process. So, so this was not just a decision made by a kid that we thought was okay. My wife is the deputy commissioner of the Department of Corrections in Alaska. My daughter is a clinician in the Ventura County Jail. This was a family decision. My 84-year-old father went and visited Brett in jail. We all came up to the determination that he needed this psychiatric evaluation, he needed this mental health help, and the safest place for our son was to leave him in the Todd County facility. We could have not possibly been more wrong, and I could not possibly be more disappointed in the actions that led up to his death and the actions of the other jails that have just made these statistics untenable. 50 deaths between 2000 and 2015, according to your own legislative audit, and 50 deaths following that, twice the national average in suicide rate. Um, I don't blame any one individual, but I think as a society, we have to do better. As a group of individuals, we have to do better. These are people that are at their, at their lowest point, at their most vulnerable point. I said before, my son was a Christian. He, like I, believed that we were all made in God's image. And the time that the people need the help the most is the time that we ought to be there for them. That is not the case. It has proven not to be the case. I no longer have a son. My son and daughter no longer have a brother. My 87 and 82 year old grand or parents are still suffering daily from his loss. Um, we can't do anything about Brett but I know Brett would want to say this to you. Please, God, please do what is within your power to make things better. If it's a small sequential step, be that as it may, take that step. 50 years of archaic system that is failing has to be addressed. So thank you again for the opportunity to testify. I'll be happy to participate with this bill or other issues as it goes through the process. Um, I have nothing more important right now than to make sure that no other young man or no other family goes through the same type of horror that way too many families have already. And thank you for your time today. Thank you, uh, Mr. Huber, um, for being with us uh, today and for sharing um, um, your son's story and your family's story um, um, with us. We are, um, we are humbled by it. Your love and your pride in your son um, is pretty clear. Um, and I think uh, what should be clear to all of us is that Brett deserved better. He deserved humanity. Um, frankly, he should be with us today. Um, and so the work before us is to make law so that we can make that happen for others uh, so that we don't have um, the loss of another um, beloved um, and that we have a humanity-centered uh, correction system. Thank you, Mr. Huber. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, members, uh, next uh, we will uh, hear from uh, Dalshay uh, Perry. Um, if uh, you can come forward, uh, we are privileged and humbled to have you with us as well uh, today. Uh, please give us your name and uh, please give us your name today. Welcome. Yes. Good morning, Reverend, excuse me, good morning, Representative Mariani, Representative Frazier, Representative Johnson, and the committee members. 
Thank you for giving me this opportunity to come before you today to share with you what happened to my son. And I certainly want to thank God for giving me the strength because this is by far one of the hardest things I've ever had to endure. My heart also goes out to the Huber family as well. I certainly know your pain. My name is Delshia Perry. I am the mother of Hardell Sherrill, who died in the Beltrami County Jail in September of 2018. While in custody, he suffered tremendous, tremendously. He was just 27 years of age, leaves behind three little girls who don't have a father. And explaining to them what happened has been horrific and very hard for me to do. As I said, our girl was my only child. And I just ask if any of you are listening today are parents of children, of either an only child or children. I just ask you to just put yourself in my shoes for a minute. Hardell's death was senseless, unnecessary, and completely preventable. While in custody, he developed GBS, Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is a neurological disorder that causes paralysis. Hardell spent the last few days of his life on a jail floor in unimaginable agony and pain. He couldn't eat or drink. He could not use, use his hands or legs. He couldn't use the toilet. He couldn't call his family for help. And mind you, he walked into the Beltrami County Jail just fine. He was in soiled urine and feces filled with pens and completely helpless. There was even a point where he was left to stay on a jail cell floor for nearly eight hours. The paralysis slowly spread through his body and attached his respiratory organs. He could no longer swallow or breathe. This is how my son spent his final days of life while everyone just stood by and watched. Numerous correctional officers and medical staff watched Hardell die a slow and painful death. They all thought he was faking it. Unfortunately, he was slowly dying right before their very eyes. And they just left him there on a cold jail cell floor, crying out for help for days, not minutes, days, until he took his last breath. What happened to my son sounds like a horror story from a third world country. But no, it happened right here, right here in the United States of America. The most powerful, richest, most prosperous country in the world where we have access to the best medical care and unlimited resources, but yet he was denied them all. We know almost to a certainty that Hardell would have recovered from his condition if he were hospitalized, instead of being left to fend for himself on the jail floor. And again, let me remind you, there were times that he was left on the jail cell floor for eight hours. But the people in charge of his care thought of him as less than human, that he didn't deserve to have a chance to return to his family and friends, that he didn't deserve even the basic of medical care. He was not just my son, but he was my best friend. He was my everything outside of God. We did everything together. And when he died, a piece of me died too. He was a nephew, he was a cousin, he was a friend to many in our lives, has been forever changed. I have been traumatized by seeing the way that he was treated and suffered for days. So I ask you why this bill must pass. Because laws haven't changed in over a hundred years and jail reform is needed to help prevent this from happening again to someone else's son or daughter. This bill must be made about saving lives and preventing senseless deaths. Hardell was not the first nor the last to die in Beltrami County Jail. I don't know if you remember Bruce Lundmark. Well, he got sick there. 
And instead of taking him to the hospital, they quickly shipped him off to another county jail where during booking, he died. He didn't even get to get booked in. He died during booking. That's horrific. It's unacceptable. And the reason I have been fighting the way that I have been fighting is when I've learned about all the suspicious deaths in Beltran County Jail. And I knew that I had to do something. And this is the something that I do. My brother, Traren Cruz, and many of my other family and friends have been helping me to go out and protest and rally and tell what happened. The truth is what we've been fighting for. For them to understand that they didn't just take away an inmate. He wasn't just another inmate. He was my son, my only child. My brother has helped me tremendously. Excuse me to continue this fight. Minnesota County jails are so unregulated. People are dying. And until Hardell's death and everything that has happened, no one noticed. Or if they did, it seemed that they didn't care because it wasn't affecting them and their son or daughter. My goal with getting this bill passed into law is to save lives and allow those incarcerated to be able to pay their debt to society without being tormented, tortured, mistreated, or neglected like my son. I'm not asking for any special treatment for jail inmates, no. And I'm not asking for any special accommodations. All I'm asking is that the county jail treat people as human beings. It's a piece of minimum standards to make sure that people stop dying senselessly. So I ask you to name this bill in honor of my son as a small token of honor for his girls. We wouldn't be here today asking that this bill be put in my son's name had it not been for all the hard work that myself and Trey and so many others have rallied and protested and gone before the governor and other places. If we had done what we had done to bring this to your attention today, again, is left behind a heartbroken mom. Thank you, Ms. Perry, uh, for being with us um, today. Our, our, our hearts um, are broken with you. Um, and as I share with Mr. Huber, um, uh, your son should still be with us uh, today. Um, uh, he deserved way better. He deserved nothing short of humanity. Um, it's not, in my opinion, that complicated. Um, and um, we will uh, work with you and the other families uh, to make sure that our laws reflect um, the painful learning uh, that should not have been learned um, so that other families um, do not have to endure what you, what you are enduring. Um, we um, um, will work together uh, for that. Um, and as we do that, uh, please uh, accept our sincere um, love and uh, wishes for you and your family for some peace and some healing um, um, as you go forward. Thank you so much for being with us here today. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Mariani and the committee. God bless you all. God bless you, ma'am. Um, I think that's what we have for uh, testifiers, uh, Representative Long. Uh, there are several amendments uh, before us. Um, I do see Representative Frazier's hand is up, um, and so I'll, I'll call on him at this point. Thank, thank you, Chair Mariani. I 
you covered much of, you touched on some of the things I wanted to say, Ms. Nielsen, thank you for, thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for, for bringing that um, and, and bringing your son into this conversation and his life won't be in vain. Um, you know, one of the one questions I just, I wanted to ask directly to, to Commissioner Schnell is, is if, if there's any, any power you have in your authority as an executive um, to, to disrupt or change the manner in which we're using our jails to prevent situations like this from happening in the future. I'm, I'm just, I'm just asking, find, find it, have your people look into that and do everything you can. Because this, some, this sounds, this story sounds like it could have been prevented. We didn't have to have to hear this story today. Ms. Nielsen, again, thank you for bringing it and, and we'll do everything we can to make sure this doesn't happen again. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Representative Frazier. Uh, Commissioner Schell. Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Frazier, just uh, the, the name, uh, just so you know, the name on the screen is, is actually one of a staff here because she's using a computer at our at our office. So uh, Ms. Perry is, is in a different room um, and um, so she needed access to a computer. So she's, she's actually here. Uh, and I, your point is well taken. Um, and I uh, will tell you that um, we look, we'll look at, uh, this is all grounded in rulemaking and we have rulemaking authority. And I think with, with, uh, with Mr. Huber and Ms. Perry's involvement and other families who've been impacted uh, we, we can, I believe, exercise um, more authority through that rulemaking process and take action. This bill, however, will also put really some important guardrails in place. Very well. Uh, thank you, um, Commissioner Schnell. Uh, members, we're going to move um, on to the amendments uh, to Representative Raleigh's earlier question. Uh, it will be the chair's intent to take up the A1 amendment followed by the uh, A5 amendment. I believe there are amendments uh, to that amendment. Um, I'll be moving on to the seven, two and four uh, after that. Uh, it is unusual for a chair to uh, share the order of the amendments. Um, uh, however, I think uh, the specialness of this bill um, 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 meets uh, um, the request of our colleagues so that folks can uh, prepare themselves. Um, so with that, uh, members, um, the chair will move the A1 uh, amendment. Uh, it's a pretty simple amendment. Um, it names the act, the Hardell uh, Sherrell uh, Act. Uh, this comes as, um, as, as a request uh, from the family uh, itself. Uh, we heard that request um, a few moments ago. Um, and let me just say that um, probably just the, the obvious that there are moments when uh, we do this, when we ascribe a name uh, to a law um, in order to emphasize the unique moment um, in our collective history as a people that call us um, uh, as lawmakers to act. Um, it's one way in which we honor uh, both the individual that's impacted uh, but also uh, through that person uh, recognize the many individuals uh, uh, impacted. Um, it's our way of saying as le legislators that we see their reality, that we see the tragedy uh, that occurred in this, in this case, that we see a tragedy and that it occurred and that we are committed um, to changing that uh, so much so that we will um, take that special step of giving uh, the law a name. Um, and, you know, at the end, members, um, for me, and I suspect for all of us here, it's about affirming the importance of laws um, to reflect our common humanity. Um, laws without humanity um, are, um, in my opinion, not laws. Um, they're rules and regulations. Uh, the law is, in my opinion, meant to be um, a manifestation or reflection of our common humanity. Um, so with that, members, um, the, uh, the chair moves the A1 amendment. Discussion. Hearing, hearing no discussion, uh, the clerk will take the roll on the amendment. Chair Mariani. 
Uh, Chair Mariani, we can do a uh, roll call if you wish. Representative Johnson. Or not a roll call, a voice vote on if, this amendment. If that's fine with you, I'm, I'm, I, we could do that, certainly. Um, thank you, uh, Representative Johnson. All in favor of adopting the A1 amendment, uh, please say aye. 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 The final same sign. Motion prevails, and the A1 amendment uh, is adopted. Um, next, we have um, the A2, no, I'm sorry, the A5 amendment, and that is the author's amendment, uh, Representative Long. Representative Long moves the A5 amendment. There are amendments to the amendment, but the Representative Long, if you can get us started. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I described the uh, A5 earlier. This is the author's amendment. And there is an A8 amendment to the A5 amendment that I would like to move. Very well. Representative Long moves. Um, actually, I have Representative Holland's name. Uh, oh, pardon me. That is Representative Holland's amendment. Okay. I will. Thank you. I got confused. No, no very well. So, uh, so let's get to the order. Uh, Representative Long moves the A5 amendment. Um, and Representative Hollins is moving to amend the A5 amendment with the A8 amendment. The A8 amendment is before us. Representative Hollins to your amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Long. Um, this is a pretty simple amendment. It just adds uh, the, the term prone restraint, which is restraining someone so they're face down to the list of prohibited uses of force. Very well, thank you, Representative Hollins. Uh, discussion, Representative Long. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm, I'm uh, would be happy to support Representative Holland's amendment, and I appreciate her bringing it. Very well. Uh, any further discussion? All right. Uh, um, so, uh, Representative, is fine. I'm sorry, Representative Johnson. A, a voice vote is fine on this. Very well. Thank you, Representative Johnson. Uh, all in favor of the A8 amendment to the A5 amendment, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion prevails, and the A5 amendment is adopted, or rather amended, uh, with the A8 amendment. There is another amendment uh, to the amendment, um, I believe, unless I've got confused. Uh, I might have a... I don't... I don't think there is. I don't believe so, Mr. Chair. Very well. Okay. Um, uh, members' discussion on the A5 amendment as amended. Representative Johnson, um, should we do a, a roll? The voice vote is fine. Very well. Thank you, Representative Johnson. All in favor of the A5 amendment as amended, please say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion prevails. The A5 amendment is adopted. Um, next, we have the A7 amendment. The Representative Hollins, I believe that's your amendment. Yes, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much. Um, I, I believe this would be considered a, a friendly amendment. Um, what this aims to do is to, um, to incorporate some of the recommendations that were created um, in the past. So in 2016, the Office of Legislative Auditor published a report on mental health care standards in jails um, with a number of concerns and urgent issues to be addressed. Um, they found that there are no procedures for following up with people who screen positive when they look at mental, mental illness in their booking assessments. Um, and so um, the OLA recommended policies and procedures for suicide prevention, well checks, solitary confinement, um, and a number of other things. And in 2018, a group of sheriffs, advocates, and the DOC um, developed language to address some of these critical issues, but the rules were never promulgated. Um, so it's been five years since the OLA's report, and um, this bill has been drafted in response to continued findings that these standards and procedures in Minnesota jails are incredibly inadequate to keep men Minnesotans with mental illness safe. Um, so this, this amendment would add minimum licensing standards for jails and addresses the recommendations on the 2016 OLA report to prevent suicides and ensure that people get mental health care that they need. It further increases accountability for the enforcement of standards by requiring the department to post on their website when facilities with are, um, are with discipline, are disciplined for violations 
and it shortens the timeline so that violations are addressed as quickly as possible. And um, it also, um, along with other important data collection in the bill, the amendment will require the department to report the number of people who were put in solitary confinement or segregation and how many people attempted suicide, how many people were transported out of the jail for medical care. Um, and that is what the amendment does. Um, I think it's an important amendment to um, try to bring in some of those recommendations that were made five years ago, and um, I, I hope that Representative Long supports it. Well, thank you, Representative Holland. So just to be clear on the record, Representative Holland moves um, the A7 uh, amendment, um, and we certainly did hear testimony from Mr. Huber um, on uh, mental health uh, uh, issues and huge gaps and flaws um, in his son's experience. Representative Long. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Hollins. I, I do support the amendment. I believe it improves the bill and adds some specificity to the mental health standards. Very well. Discussion, Representative Raleigh. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, to Representative Hollins, uh, did you work with NAMI on these standards? Representative Hollins. You're, you're Sorry, muted. I'm muted. Yes, Representative Raleigh, I did. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And Boy, I think we've got a delay. Sorry about that, Mr. Chair. Didn't mean to speak over you. By the way. Um, uh, to uh, Representative Hollins, uh, with the NAMI standards, one of the things I'm not seeing in here, and it, this might just be a clarification, with the testimony we heard previously that there were, and I'm using air quotes, there were checks that were done on some of the other um, inmates. Are there any standards that NAMI shared with you on frequency or anything else um, that we can enter into the testimony as guidance for later on? Mr. Chair. Representative Hollins. I am, I apologize. My internet must be going out. I couldn't make out anything that Representative Raleigh said. Let's give it another try, Representative Raleigh. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, my, my system is showing that uh, your bars are all in the red. So um, I'll, I'll try again. Uh, with the NAMI recommendations and with the, um, the testimony that we've heard today that uh, well checks were being performed, did, uh, in order to enter this into the record, did NAMI have any recommendations on frequency or any checks or any other recommendations in order to make sure that the health and welfare is being well taken care of not just checking a box saying we did it. Representative Hollins. Okay, thank you so much. That is an excellent question. Um, may I defer to the NAMI representative, Elliot Boutte, who's on the line as well. Uh, and I was just looking to see if there was uh, someone here. I do see Elliot uh, there. Mr. Boutte, Boutte, if you're willing to come forward and uh, uh, help us uh, uh, answer Representative Raleigh's uh, good question, we'd appreciate it. Good. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Raleigh, I'm Elliot Butai, the Criminal Justice Coordinator at NAMI Minnesota. Um, and I actually would need to get back on, on a specific time frame, but the, uh, the OLA report is, um, I think, enlightening about that. And also just some of the policies, um, I think the findings were that the well checks weren't even being done according to the current DOC policy. So that is, but I believe it, it maybe Commissioner Schnell, I think it's something like 15 minutes or half an hour is the current policy. And, uh, but I would need to double check on the national standards. Uh, uh, Commissioner Schnell, any, um, yeah. anything you could offer in this conversation? Yes, Mr. Chair um, and uh, Representative Raleigh, I think there are standards, uh, I think in many of these cases, but what, uh, what I think Mr. Huber referenced was the fact that the checks uh, were noted that they had taken place, uh, but in fact that they had not taken place in the manner prescribed by the current standard, uh, which I believe is, is a largely a national standard that would be reviewed as part of this. Uh, but um, but we would uh, make sure that I, I believe it is 15 minutes at present when people are in a watch uh, in, in a watch watch standards are uh, present uh, and uh, the challenge we're finding is uh, many times it is not occurring as prescribed. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Representative Raleigh. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate that, and I think uh, getting this testimony on the on the record will absolutely enhance and help this bill. 
I concur, Representative Rowley, and I, I do think also that um, your uh, uh, further digging in terms of making sure that whatever we legislate is not meant to just be a check the box uh, exercise, but that there is um, a force uh, of, of will and commitment and humanity behind it is critically important. So thank you for bringing that up, sir. Mr. Chair. Yes, Mr. Boutai. Um, I, the OLA report does say the National Commission on Correctional Health Care Standard for uh, inmates who are potentially suicidal is every 15 minutes. Okay, very well. Thank you. I appreciate you checking on that. Rep Senator Volio. Mr. Chair, so this amendment um, greatly expands the bill, which I'm not necessarily opposed to, but I would like to know what the Sheriff Association has to say and um, yeah, so I just want to know if there's any opposition to this amendment because it is pretty expansive. It's probably a good amendment, but it's we. I'd like to hear a little more, a little more testimony because it's pretty, pretty meaty. I don't believe we have anyone here from the sheriff. So I'm looking. If there is, uh, please pipe in. Um, I, I do know that the commissioner did share uh, earlier that uh, there were. You know, uh, careful uh, work uh, being done, and that the bill, you know, um, uh, moved um, 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 her interactions with several stakeholders, including uh, the sheriffs. Uh, so I think it's uh, it's perfectly um, reasonable for you to ask that question, Representative Obi. I don't see anyone here um, that can answer your question from that community, however. Chair, I believe. Uh, Commissioner Schnell has something. Very well. Commissioner Schnell. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative O'Neill, I would just say that that we have talked to them about uh, some of the recommendations that were coming forth. We we did that was not we did not get into the details of of these specific uh, requirements. There was interest by the sheriffs of making sure that that NAMI's voice was here as they are uh, the state's uh, standard uh, bearer around bringing these issues forward and lifting up the importance of them. Um, and so we can, we will certainly circle back with them. Um, but we did talk about a number of these things that, that NAMI had uh, brought forward by way of recommendations. And I would also add that many of these things were things that, that, that OLA really had uh, uh, addressed and, and touched on before. And what we're doing, uh, I think as Representative Hollins represented, is really moving this forward uh, in, a, in a statutory uh, fashion. Representative Hollins, I'm uh, recalling earlier in your testimony, I don't know if this goes to this point, uh, you certainly cannot speak on behalf of the sheriffs, but uh, you, you did indicate that language before, before us in this amendment uh, includes as its source um, um, uh, procedures uh, that the uh, Sheriff's Association had developed, but that rules were never promulgated. Um, so I'm wondering if you um, if there's anything there relative to um, Representative O'Neill's question, short of, of course, not you can't speak on behalf of them. But, um, is there anything there uh, relative to, to that? That's correct. Um, yeah, I, I, and I appreciate Representative O'Neill's concerns. Um, I think they're very valid. Um, my, you know, obviously I wasn't there in 2018 when this group got together to um, create some of these rules and develop the language around it. But my understanding um, from NAMI, who was there, is that um, the language of this amendment comes directly out of those stakeholder engagements. And I guess I would I would look to NAMI's representative, um, Elliot, to see if he has anything to add to this conversation. Mr. Boutai. Um, yes, um, in, thank you, Mr. Chair. In, you know, 2018, our executive director, Sue Abner Holden, was part of a group and um, they had developed language and um, we had actually worked with the former director of inspections and enforcement and we had it drafted and um, we were in the final uh, kind of phases of, of getting approval with the sheriffs and, and just tweaking it. So we do even have existing like rule language that we had agreed to before, but they just did not get promulgated. Very well. I suspect, uh, and I would certainly hope that ongoing conversations continue uh, with all stakeholders, including with our sheriffs. Chair Mariani. Uh, Representative Johnson. I do believe that uh, the Sheriff's Association has joined this call. If maybe we I get do some see Sheriff Hutton there. Um, Sheriff Hutton, welcome. 
Thank you, Chair. Uh, would you like for me to address the comments or concerns that were brought forward on the amendment? Uh, yes. Um, <laughs> I, I'm not going to repeat them, because, uh, but let me ask Representative O'Neill, perhaps, just to very concisely um, um, go over her question again. Thank you, Mr. Chair. No, this is just a very expansive amendment, the A7, and so it almost is a full bill in and of itself. And so I just wanted to hear from the Ser Sheriff's Association. Are they in favor of this? Did they help in the drafting of it? Um, and so I just want a little bit more testimony on the record because, again, this is a really meaty amendment. We don't normally put amendments on that are quite this expansive. Uh, this could be an entire committee hearing in and of itself. So I just wanted to hear kind of the process from you, like if there was any concern still with the Sheriff's Association or is it good to go? Well, to the A7 amendment, Sheriff Hunt. Uh, thank you, Chair and Representatives. Um, so we were very engaged with the OC in the discussions for this bill. Uh, we're, we are um, just a little bit shy of completely supporting the recommendations that are coming forward on the bill. However, with regards to this amendment, uh, Representative O'Neill, I would have to agree with you that it is very meaty. It's very significant. Um, we also need to remember the various sizes of jails that we have within the state. We have jails within the state which are four to six inmates and we have the size of Hennepin County. So this is not an easy um, um, amendment for us to have just seen, if you will, from last night to today. Um, to, with regards to NAMI's comments about the conversations that were occurring during the rulemaking process, um, with many of these, many concerns were brought up specific to these recommendations by NAMI um, right before the prior inspector uh, or the supervisor within the inspection unit left, we were engaged in these conversations for changes to the language. Very well, thank you, Sheriff. Um, Representative Bowen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, two things real quick. Uh, the first one is a parliamentary inquiry as far as the sequence of these um, amendments being added. The A1 amendment uh, was a name change and um, Representative Holland's amendment, the last line says, um, amend the title accordingly. I don't. Want, I want to make sure that we're not canceling out A1 with this amendment, Mr. Chair. Uh, it might be a good question for one of our legal counsel, Mr. Johnson or Mr. Diebel. Uh, Mr. Chair, this is Jeff Diebel. Mr. Diebel. That, no, that that instruction at the end of the amendment is the description of the bill, not the. Uh, title within the bill that you adopted in the earlier amendment. Thank you, Mr. Diebel. Representative Bowling? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And as long as we have the sheriff on, uh, could we ask him to comment on the overall bill itself, Mr. Chair? Certainly. Uh, I think uh, what uh, Sheriff Hutton said is that they're sh just shy of supporting the bill, uh, but uh, perhaps he want, might want to add another sentence or two, Sheriff Hutton. Thank you, Chair. Uh, representatives, yes. Um, we did a lot of work with DLC. DLC uh, carried, uh, obviously, the larger share of this, and we had four shares engaged uh, very deeply on this. Um, so we appreciate everything that DLC brought forward. Um, our concern, as you can imagine, would be how it is being, or how it may be amended. Um, and we've had those conversations with DLC to have further conversation um, after today. Uh, so I just want to give a shout out to DOC for uh, in bringing us along the way. Thank you, uh, Chair. Members, uh, we're ready to vote on the A7 uh, amendment. I take it from the conversation, we probably should do a roll call on this. And so the clerk will take the roll on the A7 amendment. Chair Mariani. Aye. Chair Mariani, aye. Vice Chair Frazier. Aye. Vice Chair Fraser, aye. Representative Johnson? No at this time. Representative Johnson, nay. Representative Edelson? Aye. Representative Edelson, aye. Representative Feist? Aye. Representative Feist, aye. Representative Grossel, excused. <laughs> Representative Hollins? Aye. Representative Hollins, aye. Representative Hewitt? Aye. 
Representative Hewitt, aye. Representative Cleveland. Representative Cleveland. Representative Long. Aye. Representative Long, aye. Representative Lucero. Representative Mueller. Mueller votes no. Representative Mueller, nay. Representative Novotny. Representative Novotny. Novotny's. Novotny's aye. Thank you. Re Novotny, aye. Representative O'Neill. O'Neill is a no. It Representative O'Neill. <laughs> Representative O'Neill, nay. Representative Pinto? Aye. Representative Pinto, aye. Representative Poston? Poston, no. Representative Poston, nay. Representative Raleigh? Raleigh, yes. Representative Raleigh, aye. Representative Vang? Aye. Representative Vang, aye. Representative Zhang? Aye. Representative Zhang, aye. Lucero, no. Representative, um, Representative Cleavorn? That concludes roll call with 12 ayes. Very well. Uh, members with uh, 12 ayes, uh, five, uh, you had five days, uh, Clark? Yes. Very well. Uh, with 12 ayes and five nays, the A7 amendment um, is adopted. Thank you, Representative Collins. Um, next, we have the uh, A2 amendment. The chair will move the A2 uh, amendment. Uh, members, uh, this uh, amendment would uh, insert um, a uh, definition of use of force as must not be applied maliciously or sadistically for the purpose of causing harm to an inmate. Uh, members, this language um, refers to a U.S. Supreme Court decision in 1986, uh, by the way, a U.S. Supreme Court decision on what constitutes a violation of Eighth Amendment uh, in the context of use of force within a prison setting. Uh, we heard testimony uh, earlier that uh, we're dipping into statutes uh, that have not been um, uh, changed, uh, perhaps not even entertained, since 1904, um, and without commenting on what the you know standards were in 1904, I, I would say that uh, it's time for us to align our standards uh, with the um, um, with the clear intent uh, behind this bill, which is in fact to prohibit abusive uh, behavior, um, and that language uh, uh, and that const construct, if you will. Um, is in finding uh, within the 1986 uh, U.S. Supreme Court uh, decision. So we're, we're, uh, we would be basically establishing a minimal standard aligned with uh, that uh, expectation of our U.S. Supreme Court uh, that clearly prohibits uh, abusive behavior. Uh, I believe that that reflects what the standards ought, probably should have been in 1904, but uh, certainly should be uh, should be um, in 2021. 20, uh, uh, so with that, members, uh, entertain any questions, uh, discussion. Representative Johnson. Uh, Chair Mariani, I have no problem with the voice vote on this. This should be the standard. The uh, I know with the corrections officers, I know and the law enforcement officer, I know as well, they never want to use uh, any more force than absolutely necessary. That's why they use the force continuum as their guide in, in all their training. And they do their best to weed out those that who actually do this um, and, and train not, not to use more force than absolutely necessary. So I, I have no problem with this amendment at all. Thank you. Appreciate your support, Representative Johnson. All in favor of the A2 amendment, please say aye. 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 All same sign. Motion prevails and the A2 amendment is adopted. The last amendment uh, is the A4 amendment. I believe that's your amendment, Representative Johnson. Uh, Chair Mariani, that, that is correct. This is my amendment. 
And that actually, uh, Commissioner Snell teed it up very well for me. He explained how important inspections are and stuff like that. Uh, and how important it is to get, have the proper inspections, making sure everything is being done properly, and also to follow up on those inspections. What this amendment does is also requires the Department of Corrections in, their, in the state facilities that we run to be inspected as well. Currently, the, every jail and in, in, uh, any facility that house uh, people that are incarcerated are required to be inspected, except for the state prison system. Uh, this amendment requires that they also be inspected and, re and that they can actually lose their license as well, uh, following the same rules that are putting on the sheriffs and the group homes um, inside the Department of Corrections. Uh, we had the OLA report and some of these issues were brought up in that. Uh, so I do ask for your support for this amendment. And I would like to request a roll call. We will roll, uh, Representative Johnson moves the A4 amendment um, and there will be a roll call. Representative Wong. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Representative Johnson for, for bringing this amendment. Certainly audits and assessments are important and a key part of ensuring that, um, that facilities are um, up to the standards that the bill is setting. Uh, I unfortunately will not be able to support the amendment at this time. It has annual inspections with the requirement of five separate individuals comprising those teams. And, and my understanding is that would potentially add additional cost to the bill. And I would need to understand that better. So I would hope that we could work together um, before we go to Ways and Means and with the Department of Corrections on, on what those costs might be. Very well, Representative Long. Uh, further discussion? Uh, members of Chair Mary. Uh, yes, Representative Johnson. Uh, Chair Mary, I am disappointed in that, but I still uh, think it is important that we do inspect our our prison system and do them regularly. As, as the OLA report uh, showed, that, that we have some deficiencies there, that uh, the only way we're going to make sure that they're done properly is with inspections um the number of facilities that they have is minor compared to the 170 some facilities that they already inspect adding the number of prisons we have is, would i believe would be minor thank you please i would ask that you do support the amendment well uh representative long uh it it, it will be uh my intention as chair to uh, follow the lead of our author here uh, however, I do want to uh, say for the record that um, I, I, I do think that Representative Johnson uh, makes an important uh, point here that uh, I would hope uh, as this bill moves forward, uh, we can work uh, together to, to address. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of independent assessments and audits, um, but I'm just one uh, legislator. But I will uh, be voting with you at this point and hoping that this conversation will uh, continue going forward. Chair, Chair Mariani. We can come back with Representative Johnson. I'm just wondering if uh, Commissioner Snell could weigh in on this as well since he is here. Certainly, uh, Commissioner Snell. Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Johnson. So I agree with you that uh, the building in a, uh, a inspection process is, uh, is important. And, and as I mentioned in my earlier testimony, we have a plan to do that. Uh, with folks, in fact, in the what we're proposing is one of the one of the su suggested methods by the OLA. So we are actually following the very recommendation that they established. Um, and I would also just just note that uh, at present in Minnesota, uh, because there's no requirement of it, the correctional facilities that the state operates are not themselves licensed facilities. Uh, that would be something that, that uh, would be a different requirement. We do, however, and, and I've made this commitment to the sheriffs, believe that we should be making sure that we are in full compliance with the very standards uh, that we're suggesting and proposing. Very well, thank you. That's very helpful. All right, uh, members, uh, the clerk will take the roll on the A4 amendment. Uh, no. Mr. Frazier. Vice Chair Frazier, no. Representative Johnson? Yes. Representative Johnson, aye. 
Representative Edelson? No. Representative Edelson, nay. Representative Feist? Nay. Representative Feist, aye. Representative Grossel? No, nay. Oh, nay. My apologies. Thank you. Representative Feist, nay. Representative Grossel, excused. Representative Hollins? Nay. Representative Hollins, nay. Representative Hewitt? It. Representative Cleavorn. Representative Cleavorn. Representative Long. No. Representative Long, nay. Representative Lucero. Yes. Representative Lucero, aye. Representative Mueller. Mueller votes yes. Representative Mueller, aye. Representative Novotny. Novotny, aye. Representative Novotny, aye. Representative O'Neill. O'Neill, aye. Representative O'Neill, aye. Representative Pinto. No. Representative Pinto, nay. Representative Poston. Aye. Representative Poston, aye. Representative Raleigh. Raleigh, aye. Representative Raleigh, aye. Representative Vang. No. Representative Vang, no. Representative Zhang. No. Representative Zhang, nay. That concludes, oh, actually, sorry. Um, Representative Hewitt. Representative Cleavorn. That concludes roll call with seven ayes and nine nays. With the uh, vote of seven ayes and nine a, the A4 amendment is not adopted. Uh, Representative Law, that concludes the amendments uh, before us. Um, we probably have about 10 minutes left in this committee, uh, just a very few seconds, and then we'll move uh, to your vote. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to thank the committee for hearing this bill today and for this important discussion, and in particular to thank Delshia and Brett for bringing forward their powerful stories, um, and I'm humbled to carry this bill in honor of Hardell and Brett, uh, and particularly with the renaming of the bill, and I'm hopeful that we can make progress on this bill this session to um, help address this urgent crisis. Very well. Uh, thank you, Representative Long, for um, bringing us a very good um, bill where we, in my opinion, need to act. Uh, with that, uh, Representative Long renews his motion uh, that House File 1267 uh, as amended. Chair Mariani. Uh, Re Representative Johnson. Yeah, I just wondered, I believe uh, in the motion this went to Ways and Means. Is that correct? That's the motion we have before us, yes, sir. Um, I'm just wondering, there's some issues dealing that uh, could, should possibly, especially with the um, one of the amendments put on here, it should go to uh, Health and Human Services, and there's also some data issues that might need to go to civil law. Um, I just want to make sure that we get it to the right place because we might might need to move it move it there, especially with that last amendment that was put on, major amendment put on dealing with mental health issues. I do believe it should go to Health and Human Services. Um, there, there certainly is a way for us to move it to ways and means and then move it um, uh, to uh, another committee and or to uh, amend uh, in ways and means, but I leave this to the, uh, to the author in the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't, I don't believe it needs to have another committee stop before ways and means, and I would uh, like to keep the motion the same and would be happy to reach out to the chairs Representative Johnson uh, suggested to confirm that after the fact. If you could reach those chairs, I, I would greatly appreciate it. Uh, very well. Uh, Representative Long uh, moves to refer House File 1267 as amended to the Ways and Means Committee. The clerk will take the roll. Chair Mariani. Aye. Chair Mariani, aye. Vice Chair Frazier. Vice Chair Frazier. Vice Chair Frazier, aye. Representative Johnson. Aye. Representative Johnson, aye. Representative Edelson. Aye. Representative Edelson, aye. Representative Feist. Aye. Representative Feist, aye. Representative Grossel, excused. Representative Hollins. Aye. Representative Hollins, aye. Representative Hewitt. Representative Hewitt. 
Representative Cleveland. Representative Cleveland. Representative Long. Aye. Representative Long, aye. Representative Lucero. Yes. Representative Lucero, aye. Representative Mueller. Mueller votes yes. Representative Mueller, aye. Representative Novotny. Novotny, aye. Representative Novotny, aye. Representative O'Neill. O'Neill, aye. Representative O'Neill, aye. Representative Pinto. Aye. Representative Pinto, aye. Representative Poston. Aye. Representative Poston, aye. Representative Raleigh. Raleigh, aye. Representative Raleigh, aye. Representative Vang. Aye. Representative Vang, aye. Representative Zhang. Aye. Representative Zhang, aye. Representative Hewitt. Representative Cleveland. That concludes roll call with 16 ayes. Uh, and the nays? 16 ayes, zero nays, and three excused. Very well, thank you. Uh, with 16 ayes and zero nays, House file, uh, the motion um, um, uh, passes and House file 1267 as amended is referred to the Committee on Ways and Means. Thank you, Representative Long, and thank you for all the uh, testifiers, um, our hearts and thoughts with um, 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 uh, Brett Huber's family and, um, 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 and with Del Shea uh, Perry uh, as well.